Hey guys, Larry here. Just to give you a gentle reminder to head over to GoFundMe.com and check out the Save Tour Supply account. And if you've got a couple of bucks, a few dollars, just a little bit of cabbage, you can throw their way. It would go a long way in helping them to stay afloat, stay in business, and keep providing the roadie community with all the fantastic gear and personal service that they've been doing for the last, like, 40 years, man. Larry Martin's been at this game for a long time. So head over to GoFundMe.com and do a search for Save Tour Supply. They could use your help. It would really go a long way. Let's get it done. What's happening, roadies? This is Stephen Charlie Cohen. This is Michael Lardy from Great White. What's happening, roadies? This is Matt McGlynn from Roswell Pro Audio, and you are listening to Roadie Free Radio. What's up, roadies? My name is Larry Milburn, and this is Roadie Free Radio, your VIP pass to meet and greet the stars behind the scenes of the music and film business. All right, all right, what's happening, roadies? Welcome to episode 172. My guest this week is Mr. Matt McGlynn from Roswell Pro Audio. Before we get to him... This is your host, Larry Milburn, coming at you from a barn in Northwest Connecticut. How in the world are you all doing? How was your weekend? Woo, it was hot back here on the East Coast. Pretty humid, finally getting a little bit of rain, a little touch of rain. We could use a lot more, but uh, I'll tell you, things, uh, things are heating up. Summer's here, man. Summer's here. People are getting out. They're taking precautions, or they're not. I guess it's I guess it's up to the individual to put their own fate and the fate of others in their hands. What are you going to do? Hey, happy birthday shout out this week goes to Charles Twilling. Happy birthday, Charles. I hope you are doing well, my man. Uh, it's been an interesting time. I want to just touch on something before we, a couple things real quick before we jump into this episode. Uh, as many of you know, I made a video several weeks back, it feels like now, for Crew Nation uh, to help raise some fun through Live Nation uh, to help raise some funds for the roadie community across the board, across the world. And that video has done pretty well, you know, and, and I'm excited by that. Thank you for everybody who who's watched it and who's been able to give some money and do that. I was very excited to do something like that until this last week when Live Nation put out um, – this memo or this memo leaked or however it came out about what they're going to be doing going forward uh, with artists in regards to, you know, upcoming festival fees and things like that. And I'm just going to read through quickly some of this stuff, because if you've missed it, um, you got to go check it out. It's a little it's it's kind of fucked up. I'm not going to lie. It's a little fucked up. Uh, there is a video that I will link in the show notes on the website that explains all of this stuff really well by a guy named Damien Keys um, on YouTube. So head over, find that link. He goes in depth on it and why it's so fucked up. But let me just read you some of these points because it's it's a little crazy from them. So insurance wise now, the artist is required to maintain its own cancellation insurance as the promoter is not responsible for the artist fee in the event of a cancellation of the festival due to weather or a force majeure. Now, let me just tell you why I'm reading this stuff, because it's a trickle-down situation here, okay? If Live Nation screws the artist or makes it harder for the artist to do their thing or puts them on the line and makes them responsible, well, guess what? All that money's going to trickle right down and get taken away from the roadies, All right, so that's the insurance. Here we go. Cancellation by artist. If an artist cancels its performance in breach of the agreement, the artist will pay the promoter two times the artist's fee. That's right. The artist will pay the promoter two times the artist's fee. That's fucked up. Okay, cancellation due to poor sales. If a show is canceled due to poor ticket sales, the artist will receive 25% of the guarantee. Again, fucked up. Force majeure. If the artist's performance is canceled due to an event of force majeure, including a pandemic similar to COVID-19, the promoter will not pay the artist its fee. The artist is responsible for obtaining any cancellation insurance for its performance. Now, here's what's crazy. Let's go back in that sentence. If the artist's performance, if the artist's performance is canceled due to an event 
of force majeure, including a pandemic similar to COVID-19, the promoter will not pay the artist its fee. Now, they could claim anything, right? Let's just say it's just a regular bad flu season and they want to cancel the show. Then they can cancel the show and not pay the artist. Now, how's the artist going to pay its crew? That's what I want to know. Inability to use full capacity of the venue. If the promoter, either because of orders of the venue or any government entity, is not permitted to use the full capacity of the venue, then the promoter may terminate the agreement and artists will refund any money previously paid. How can I take the artist, fuck him or her as best I can, and in turn, Fuck all the people that work for the artist. Well, they've just done it. Like I said, Damien Keys has a killer video on YouTube that really gets into a lot of this stuff and lays it out probably better than I can and certainly more eloquently than I can. He's got a better accent. So you might want to head over and watch that. Again, that link is going to be in the show notes for this episode over at roadiefreeradio.com. I want to end that by leaving you on a high note. And the high note is this. Uh, our friend Zito, who's been on the show, great dude, great dude. In this time, he has, uh, with his wife, started a company called Z Bakery Nashville. They make all sorts of tasty little treats, all sorts of tasty little treats, and they have been killing it. Uh, he's been in the entertainment industry with his wife a long time, and through this pandemic, he decided to focus on his other love, which is baking. And they have just been crushing it, man. They're, they're, they're doing it. And I'm, I'm so proud and so happy for them. I think it's great. So first, what I want you to do is head over. Uh, you can find them all over social media, Facebook, Instagram, all that stuff. Z Bakery Nashville. Follow them. They post a lot of the behind the scenes and the goings ons of, of what they're doing to make this stuff happen. But check this out. They are so floored by the response to their product, to their tasty little treats, Um, that they are giving back. So 50% of each cinnamon roll is donated to the Music Cares Foundation to help other roadies that are also out of work. I think that is so super cool, and I want to give a shout-out to them. So head over, buy some cinnamon rolls, and get yourself fat during this time. And while you're getting fat, if you need some camera gear or some audio gear, you're looking to live stream some stuff, and you've got to fill out your equipment rent it. It's a lot better than going out and buying it. All right. So check out Lens Rentals. That's who I use when I rent gear all the time. It comes really well packed in a flight case, a nice Pelican case. They give you the return label. It's awesome. They are the largest online rental provider for photography, videography, and lighting equipment and accessories in the United States. They carry camera bodies and lenses in every format from every major manufacturer and all the audio, lighting, and support accessories needed to cover any kind of shoot from a family holiday card to a commercial advertising job and plenty of live stream stuff. All equipment purchased is sold within two years, so customers are assured that their stock is always in like-new condition. I'm telling you guys, too, they also have killer customer service. If you use the code RODY15, the number 15, RODY15, you get yourself 15% off your order. That's RODY15 when you check out over at LensRentals.com. I'm telling you, don't go out and buy the thing. Rent it first. Check it out. See if you like it then you can make a purchase. And the greatest cool, the coolest thing that they have going on at lensrentals.com is they have a a keeper fee, keeper quote, it's called. So when you rent an item, like for me, I rent the Canon EOS R quite a bit, and I'm going to pull a trigger here this summer and pick one up. Uh, When you rent it, if you go to your invoice or whatever it is, there's a button. You can say keeper quote. You hit that button, and it will generate a quote discounting your rental rate off the price of buying that particular camera or item that you have. So then you just keep it. You just give them your money and you just keep it. It's awesome. It's good stuff. Uh, So lensrentals.com. You want to get on that. All right. So my guest is Matt McGlynn from Roswell Pro Audio up in Sebastopol, California. Uh, Great guy. I've gotten to know Matt over the last, I'd say maybe three years now. Met him at the first AES, I believe it was, that I went to. 
or Nam, I can't remember, through Liz Shaw over at Recording Studio Rockstars. And he was kind enough back then to send me the Roswell Delphos microphone. If those of you who have been listening for a long time, you remember I loved that microphone. That was one of the first mics that I put up when I was doing the show that was like, oh, <laughs> this is what a really good mic sounds like in here. And uh, anyway, I couldn't afford the mic, so I, I sent it back, and uh, it broke my heart to do so. But then he came out with the Mini K87 and the Mini K47, uh, was kind enough to let me try out the 87, which, as you know, I've been using since the fall. I love this mic. Uh, we talk about it on the show. I think he's using the 47 on his end of this, and um what a knowledgeable guy, man. Super laid back. And, and his story, we get into how he's adapted and pivoted during this pandemic uh, with the factory and whatnot and, 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 the, and the things he's put into place to, to keep these mics coming out. He's also the man behind MikeParts.com and RecordingHacks.com, where he really dives deep into microphones and, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, there's also an added bonus up front in this episode you will hear which I guess I haven't talked about really at all. <laughs> Interesting. You will hear about why my why and how my NAM show this past January got cut short prematurely, I might add. Uh, I'm going to leave it at that. There you go. Uh, Matt has been kind enough to offer us a code as well. So when you go to roswellproaudio.com and you purchase yourself a new microphone, if you use the code RODI, when you check out, you get yourself a free T-shirt. Now, I can't give you a free microphone, but I got you a free T-shirt, and they're pretty cool T-shirts. So head over and use that code, Rody. That is only good through the end of July 2020, okay? End of July 2020. So if you're hearing this episode, and it's like November of 2023, you can't use the code, all right? Maybe I've got a different offer at that point, but not right now. End of July, you get yourself a free T-shirt when you buy yourself a uh, uh, a microphone. Get yourself a microphone, man. Uh, listen, this show is also sponsored today by live audio engineer Chris Wilson over at the Show Pro Beard Co. Compound. He's my man. He has created his very own unique formula of beard balm that not only performs well in terms of health and nourishment, but also provides the control, shine, and pleasant aroma that any bearded professional would appreciate. These are non-waxy, all-natural beard balms that will leave your beard soft, smooth, and nourished. Choose from a variety of natural smelling scents like Home Sweet Home, Morning Wood, Through the Woods, Chain Motor Oil, and of course, they've got Original Unscented. Use the code RODI to get 20% off your entire order. That's RODI when you check out over at showprobeardco.com. Get yourself 20% off. I put some on this morning. I use it every morning. I just have a little stubble these days. But there's something about the ritual of putting it on and how good it smells. I dig it. Uh, all right. That's all I got for you this week, guys. Enjoy this episode. I really, really had a great time talking with Matt. We got, uh, we got some good stuff coming up over the next couple of weeks. So turn up your mics. Get those preamps warm. Get your tubes cooking. Here we go. Mr. Matt McGlynn. Oh, and get over there to Z, Z Bakery, Nashville, and get yourself some... some uh, some sweet treats. <laughs> Some sweet treats. I'm in a weird mood. What can I say? All right, here we go. Mr. Matt McGlynn. Hit it, hit it. Call yourself a roadie. Call yourself a roadie. Call yourself a roadie. Matt, what is happening, dude? It's good to see you and, and hear your voice. Good to see you too, man. Been a while. It has been a while. It's been since, uh, since Nam, in fact. Was it Nam? It was, it was Nam. It, it was Nam. It was uh, the last time I actually saw you was at Bubba Gump Shrimp. That's right. When you graciously took us out for dinner. And um, I, I, I'm not going to take up too much time at the head of this to tell you this, but if you remember, I split early saying I had to get my foot taken care of. That's right. Did it recover? Uh, I'm actually dealing with it still. Oh, at, at that point, I was I was dealing with the ankle and recovering from that. That has all led to some of the worst plantar fasciitis I've ever experienced in my life. Oh my! Uh, so I'm I'm still working through that. But um, what really happened, <laughs> even though that was painful, You're was that I I am yeah. susceptible to I get AFib episode atrial fibrillation episodes sometimes, and I actually went into AFib at the dinner. 
No. And when I went to the restroom, I, I felt it happen. I went to the restroom and was like, you know, fuck, is this really happening right now? I got to get back to the hotel room because I carry these little pill and pocket things I'm supposed to take to like slow my heart rate down. So that's when I came back and I was like, Hey guys, foot hurts. I got to get back to the hotel. Long story short, dude, I ended up at the UC Irvine emergency room at 1230 and didn't get back to my hotel until 330, four o'clock in the morning. And never, that was it. I just woke up, packed up my shit and, and headed back up to the Hollywood Hills and then flew out the next day. Oh totally my God, cutting is- my totally cutting my experience at Nam this year short. Oh, that is terrible. Well, I, so how serious is that? Does it, it means your heart's racing, or what does that mean? It basically, yeah, it's like an arrhythmia of the heart. So in my particular case, it can go up to like one eighty something, one nineties, drop back down on the next beat. It can like skip a couple of beats in there, do wow. more than two or three, four beats in a you know in a pop. So it basically it feels like a frog is in a cage in the middle of your chest and is trying to get out. And wow. um, I, so I went back to the that? room. It, uh, it gets more serious if they happen more often as you get older. I'm what's known as a lone afibber, meaning like I haven't had one in a year. Um, so, but then it could be five years. I might not get another one for another bit, but there are triggers like you know, too much caffeine, uh, alcohol, all that stuff. And, uh, that, and then stress is a big one and sleep and all that. So, you know, a situation like Nam, even though I was like riding the high of the, of the whole experience and doing the panel and all those things, that thing happened. And it's so, uh, it just so bummed me out because it was like, here I was having a great time. I was having a great time at the dinner. Yeah. Um, and um, anyway, so that's why I split and I didn't even text anybody. Cause I also felt like I could have reached out to someone, I guess that night, but I didn't, I don't know everybody there, you know, that well. Um, so I didn't want to burden anyone in their NAM show with like, Hey, can you come to the hospital with me? So I just, yeah. I just went, man, it was, it was crazy, but that's the last time we saw each other. Dude, that is a terrible story. I'm so sorry that happened to you. It's okay. It's, it's all good. You know, in, in fact, it's actually changed a lot of stuff since then. So like even less coffee. Now I'm down to like a cup of decaf in the morning and I've upped the yoga yeah. routine and, you know, really tied, tried to dial it down. But actually what, what the thing too, that I found out that was a trigger that night was obviously super tired day two, you know, all the running around. And then we went out to dinner, bubble gum shrimp. And I had actually eaten at like three o'clock was when I finally had lunch. Yeah. And I'd eaten a lot. I had, they had like, you know, I'm vegan obviously. And so I had like a beyond burger, one of those stalls and a yeah. French fry. So by the time we went to dinner, I was already full. And if you remember, I had that salad, but they brought yeah, the yeah. veggie burger with cheese or something. And you're like, take that thing back and get, get him another one. So by the time I was done with the salad, I was already full. I should have stopped. Oh. If you eat too much, it triggers a vagal nerve or the vagus yeah. nerve or something like that. Right. And yeah, yeah, that yeah. can trigger AFib, which I didn't know. And I just ate oh, and ate and ate, man. It was crazy. So, um, I'm hoping that my next NAM experience, if there is another fucking NAM, um, yeah, really. you know, is is certainly better. But it was it was a bummer. But it, in a way, it was a good thing because, like I said, it's it's forced me to like slow it down, relax, and uh, get the yoga and stuff going. But unfortunately, that's the last time I saw you, and I hope the rest of your NAM show was good. <laughs> well, I didn't end up in the hospital. <laughs> yeah, so anything. It's that's a plus. Better than that. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, God, I'm so sorry that happened to you. And it, but I guess if it only happens like uh, every year or something, I can see where you wouldn't necessarily be primed. You wouldn't have the pills in your pocket. You wouldn't be expecting it. Yeah, that's tough. Yeah, it's uh, and like I said, it can happen. I might not get another one for ten more years. I got the first one when I was 22, living in LA. Had never had anything like it, and then. Oh, that's scary. It was 10 years later, you know, they got the next ones. So anyway, how are you, man? How are you doing? I'm doing good. Uh, yeah, it's been, it's been a crazy time, you know, talking about, um, the, the NAM show. Um, it is interesting. You know, you mentioned some of that, like lack of sleep, stress, caffeine as triggers. That is total that's a, that is the trade show experience in a nutshell. Yeah. Um, and it's, uh, of course, as you say, 
you know, will there be another one? I'm sure there will be because there are too many people whose whose livelihoods depend on there being trade shows. I saw a figure. These numbers tend not to stick in my head, but it was like a two hundred billion dollar industry, like not just audio, not just NAM, but trade shows. Wow, are a huge, huge deal. And they've we've had none now since what March first or whatever. Yeah. Um, but it's a little scary because uh, AES would be my next show from mm-hmm. Roswell. So AES is the Audio Engineering Society. It's a big show in New York at Javits every year. It's smaller than NAM because it's just pro audio. Although I guess they co-locate with NAB. Yeah. So next in that next hall. So they kind of have two things, you know, going. And it kind of doubles the size, but it's still a relatively small show. But anyway. Um, uh, it's in New York and New York has been hit pretty hard by the pandemic and um, they haven't decided the AES folks have not yet decided whether they would actually host the show. Mm. My sense is being a complete outsider, they need to because they've been sending out fundraising notices because they're yeah. know, without conventions and expos and stuff. Their income stream has dried up to some degree. And again, I don't have any insider information, but my sense is they kind of need to do this to keep the lights on. Um, but from my, and I've already paid for a booth, actually two booths. I was going to have two booths, you know, side by side for both my companies. Um, but I'm a little scared to go because, you know, a, I think the crowd will be half the size. I think a lot of people are just going to stay away because if you don't need to go and there's a risk to going, will anyone go? Um, but it's, it's tough to, uh, to sort of sort through this because on the one hand, I think the crowd will be smaller and I think the exhibitor list will be shorter. I think a lot of exhibitors will just be like, you know, I'm not going to subject myself to that risk. On the other hand, the people that do show up are going to be really into it. And the fewer exhibitors, there are going to get a ton of mind share. Right. But, uh, you know, and then to top it all off, my wife said, yeah, you can go, but don't come back. <laughs> you get a hotel room and I'll see you in two weeks. <laughs> well, that's the other part of it too, right? It's like, what could the experience be like? I mean, you, you think of, I mean, you've been to certainly way more trade shows than I have over the years, but I've been to AES. I think that's where we first met a couple of years back. And, Could be, yeah. you know, there's a lot of handshaking and touching of product and Used talking in close and you got to get close because it's so loud at these things. Right. So how does it look like, and what does the Javits center do to protect itself from liability, yeah. right? So, are you in like a full stormtrooper outfit? Totally. Right, right, and yeah, like plexiglass I, face shield, and yeah. And is that yeah. even worth the experience? Yeah, and yeah, then I mean, we have a, a demo booth, a demo station in the booth where we've got all the microphones on a stand, and then a little mixer, and so everyone comes up. Hopefully, they're not putting their mouth on the mic. I've seen it happen. Sure. Um, uh, but there's a mixer, and so everyone's touching the knobs. I mean, yeah, we can hose it down with alcohol after every couple of minutes. I mean, we, we've always kept hand sanitizer in the booth. Yeah. Anyway, because 10 years ago, I was at NAM. I came back down with, you know, NAM thrax or <laughs> NAMonia, whatever. Yeah. I came home from that, and I was sicker than I've ever been. Yeah. You know, sicker than any two times being sick previously. For a week, I was just out. So ever since then, I've been fairly meticulous about, you know, trying to de-germ to some degree, and it, it seems to help. I haven't haven't had that issue again. But but this is a whole new level of of screwed upness in yeah. terms of you know germs and all that. And um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I'm undecided. I'm, I'm honestly, I'm kind of hoping that the next couple shows are canceled because that way I don't have to decide. Yeah, you know, like there that way there's no loss to me. You know, if they cancel, yeah, if they exactly. cancel, you get money back. I assume so. You know, honestly, that's not even the biggest concern. The least of it, yeah, <laughs> right. So, um, the other thing I wanted to start with too, just so you, are you on an eighty-seven mini K eighty-seven over there? What do you got there? I am using a mini K forty-seven. The forty-seven. Yeah. So it's you know for because so this so for folks who don't know, uh, I, I run a company called Roswell Pro Audio. We make two affordable mics. Larry has one. I have the other. Um, and <laughs> the only both... two in existence. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. Uh, so they're both small. They're both condenser mics. Um, and they're, they're just really easy. They're really easy to use. And 
Um, I, so the 47, they, they differ in, in color, in sonic color. And so the 47 has this sort of uh, forward mids is kind of one of the catchphrases that people use to describe this kind of sound, but it's got a presence bump around four kilohertz. The Mini K87, which is the one Larry's on, is flatter and more neutral. Mm -hmm. So it's like the frequency sweep is basically a flat line from around 200 to 500 hertz, depending on proximity, up to about 10K, maybe maybe 11 or 12K. So it's kind of just a flat line. The Mini K47, which is what I'm on, has this presence bump around mm -hmm. 4K. And so um, that aids in vocal clarity. Uh, so it's uh, it, it helps... Um, it just helps voices be more understood. It helps a lot of other things too, guitars and pianos and whatnot. But yeah, for this kind of podcasting thing, it works well f for my voice anyway. They it's, I, I know we've talked about this before and for people listening, you know, I, I know I've mentioned it before on the show, a certain mics <clears throat> because I'm not traditionally an audio engineer or, you know, or producer or anything like that. I, I can take my skills audio wise to a certain level, not that far, like maybe three steps in. I know how to use an EQ and this and that and some gain structure very minimally. So I need stuff that I can take out of the box. It's like 85% there that I can listen to and say, oh, that's, that's the sound in my head that I want it to sound like. Yeah. Anything less than about 85% and I have to start tweaking and do this and that, it's... I, I need it to just be faster for me and more efficient. And this mic, uh, when you sent me this back in the fall, I pulled it out and immediately fell in love with. And to not blow too much sunshine about this mic for you, <laughs> um, you know, most of the people I talk to and use the setup in here for are audio folks, right? My, my audience and folks who listen to the podcast and whatnot. But through this whole pandemic, that's had to change and it's had to be my video clients and it's had to be, I just did Saturday night. I just had my 30th uh, high school reunion, boarding school reunion. Wow. And our class was the only class that said, cause they canceled everything in person. Sure. And our class was the only class that said, no way we're going to have a reunion regardless. We had a really tight class. So for the, week, the weeks leading up to that call, um, I've been doing zoom calls like this and I have mm -hmm. to tell you, man, every call I've done, people are like, Whoa, dude, what's your deal? Like, I love your studio, but your mic sound, your voice sounds great. Cause I think outside of the audio world, people are used to like yelling at their laptop, right? <laughs> or like doing that and they're just not used to it. And I want to be like, it's not that much of a step to just add a better microphone than your yeah. laptop has to get going. But I want you to know I was voted like best sounding <laughs> alumni guy on the call. That's awesome. <laughs> um, and well, that's it, it is, it's a, it's a great mic, man. I know we talked about trying the 47 and you're like, no, if you like the 87, stick with that. And it's good. Yeah. And it's, it's been amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's, I'm glad it's working for you. And these you know, are the, your two entry levels, as you said. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, uh, they're both. So the mini K 47s 349 and the mini K 87s 399. Mini K87 is, uh, it, it basically just, it's harder to make. Mm. Um, it, th that one requires some special care to get it dialed in the way we want it. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of hands-on that goes into that. So, but, you know, I think the world has really woken up to uh, audio, at least to some degree. And, and this that's saying something considering the way MP3s have sort of taken over <laughs> audio and yeah. You know, to a, to a consumer, MP3 means convenience, right? I can carry a million songs in my pocket. I can Bluetooth them to my car stereo. I don't need to carry around media anymore. I mean, what a miracle. Yeah. But to an audio engineer, the compromises involved in squashing audio data to such a small bundle, uh, it, it's, it's painful, you know? Yeah. Like how much yeah. fidelity am I giving up for that convenience? And so there's two sides of that argument and... Clearly, convenience is one. There's like no question that convenience is, has beaten fidelity for the vast majority of people. All that said, since the pandemic and due to the pandemic, everyone who used to have a job that required any kind of meetings, interactions, you know, group consensus kind of stuff, everyone's doing that online now. Yeah. And as you say, they're shouting into their laptops and it sounds awful. Yeah. Earbud microphones, 
it's a coin toss. You know, I've had Apple brand earbuds where the microphone, the, the, the speakers, the earbuds themselves sound fine, but the microphone is not great. The laptop is worse. I mean, the problem with your laptop mic is not the problem of the mic. It's the problem of the room you're sitting in. Yeah. You know, a lot of people are sitting in their living rooms with the vaulted ceiling and the hardwood floor. And every time they speak, you can hear their voice bouncing off of all those hard surfaces and coming into the microphone a second later. Yeah. So it just sounds cavernous. Yep. It's a nice effect occasionally, but it's terrible in a meeting. Right. It's, it's unintelligible and this and that. So, um, so I've heard uh, that people who make USB microphones have seen massive increases in sales. Yeah. Because people are tired of that sound. They don't want to sound bad. Like, you know, when you go to a business meeting, typically, you know, you shower, you do your hair, you get dressed. But now you don't, I mean, whether or not you have to do that now for your Zoom meeting, the way you present yourself is, is through the microphone. Yep. And if you sound bad, then that really reflects on you. Right. Um, and I've had meetings with with uh, people in this industry, in the audio industry, and um, it just sounded awful. And I'm like, wow, how do you like, how do you not make that connection? Right. You know, like this right. is how people experience you now. Yeah. So maybe it's maybe it's just a, a hand me down from the phone days. Like no one ever thought what their phone microphone sounded like. On the other hand, it was right next to your mouth, so it didn't matter. Right, exactly. <laughs> it's the exactly. distance. It's when your laptop is two feet away. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. So, uh, but it is a big step. I think you know, like I, we as a company are not are not pushing products for the conference audience because it's it is too big a step. USB, I get that. Right, you buy one thing, you plug it in, and it just sounds better. Yeah. Right. That's that passes what. And I don't mean this in a derogatory way, it passes the mom test, right? Yeah. Like if it's simple enough that someone's mother could just do it without thinking about it, uh, I think that's that's easy to do. The microphones I make are really designed for studios, as you know, and, and it isn't difficult to plug it into like a USB mic pre, mm -hmm. you know, USB audio interface. Mackie makes them, Presonus, Focusrite, yep. and others. Uh, a lot of companies make these. They're you know ninety nine dollars, so it's not that big a deal. But for the typical Zoom meeting person, probably a stretch. Yeah, that sound good though. Unless of course they've got a setup at home where like they're going to be most of the time, like their office, for example. You know, then they could oh, sort totally. of build it out and be. Oh, it's worth it. Separate steps. I mean, it, it is. It's like it's not that crazy um, an investment. And to be totally honest, I know we talked about this at Nam too, and you know, to be sort of transparent about it uh, for, for folks listening, like I look at a lot of fellow YouTubers who sort of blindly, and it's nothing wrong with that particular mic, and in, in totally honest, I've never even used one. I want to try one. Who blindly see someone using like an SM7B, a Sure FM7B, and just go, like, that's the mic I got to have. That's the podcast sure. mic, right? Yep, yep. And I love this because it's not that. I like to do something a little different than everybody else and yeah. still get a great result. And I think that's, I think if people just took a moment to sort of try different things, see how their voice sound on it, if you can, I mean, you know, it's hard. You're not going to go out and buy four different mics if you're uh, just starting a podcast or whatever, but right. you shouldn't be spending $400 on a microphone anyway, if you're just starting, which is what I tell people. But have you seen a jump at all in these two mics in terms of the podcasting world for you this in the last three months? Um, well, so two part answer. Um, and then I want to get back to the SM7B because I think that's a really interesting question. Um, so we've seen a, a huge uptick in sales, um, but I don't know what they're for. Like, we don't know. Yeah. We, we try to reach out to people because I, in general, I love hearing what people do with the mics that I make. Yeah. I get a lot of uh, sort of vicarious pleasure out of, you know, hearing music and, and whatever is created with these, these devices. But um, so we try to reach out to people, but we don't always know what they do with them. So whether it's podcasting or something else, I don't always know. Um, now the SM7B is, you know, it's a classic broadcast mic. Um, the catch with it, and this is, I've said this a million times, so people may have heard this before, but it has, it's basically the lowest output microphone you're ever likely to come across. Right. So what that means is you need a whole lot of preamp gain to get a good signal out of it. Uh, and that's, there's various ways to do that. Uh, you know, one way is to just turn your preamp up to 11. That's not the best way to do it. Right. Um, especially if you have an, a lower cost, you know, consumer, what I call consumer grade preamp, you know, something that's under a couple hundred bucks a channel. 
um, when you turn those up past about three quarters, they tend to get noisy. Not all of them, but a lot of times they sound great as you're turning the dial. You know, the sounds great. You're halfway. Sounds great. You're at three quarters and all of a sudden psh, you just hear this kind of white noise. Yeah. So, um, so the, the fix to that, one fix to that is to use a, a product from a, a company that's uh, run by some friends of mine. Cloud Microphones makes a thing called a cloud lifter. It's an inline preamp little blue box you plug your mic into one end plug your other end into the preamp and it gives you a bunch of extra gain so but that does add expense so you've right. got your you know your and i don't know what the sm7 costs 400 bucks maybe That's yeah i think it's 399 time. yeah yeah so the, the, you got that for the mic i think the cloud lifter is in the 150 170 range then you're preamp is going to be at least 99 bucks so it, it does start to stack up but so that's one thing and that's you know those problems are all solvable and the mic does sound great on a lot of voices no mic is universal right there's no microphone that is awesome on every voice the mic that you have the mini k87 is uh, uh it's very neutral in its voicing so it's yes. more likely to be compatible with a lot of voices um, microphones that are more colored tend to be more selective about what voices they complement Right. As a general rule, that's that's what I believe, and that's what I've experienced. Now, the SM7, um, it has a, a voicing switch on it, so you can get a couple different kinds of sounds out of it, so you'd have to experiment with that. Um, but, uh, but you should try it, as you say. And then the other thing I was going to say about this is that the SM7 is a dynamic mic, and so it tends to work best when it's right up close to the source. Yeah, especially for podcasting. So your voice is not that loud, like the human voice is not a super loud source. And so a dynamic microphone is really good for hearing things that are kind of right in front of it. Um, but it means you kind of have to get on it. So if you so the, the my canonical example of, of this mic is uh, um, Joe Rogan, mm -hmm. um, who I now I, I believe he uses an SM7. I actually I don't pay that much attention, but I believe that's what he uses. He does. Yeah. But he uh, he's right on it. Like he's got the thing right below his lips. Yeah. When he speaks, and um, and so if you're if you're just doing audio, that's great. If you're doing video too, consider: Do you really want the mic in your face? Now it works for Joe. He sounds great. He looks great. He's super successful, no question. Uh, but everyone who who's thinking about buying that should should ask that question: Like, do I want to basically eat that mic? Because that's kind of what you need to do to have it sound the way you probably want it to sound. Right. The denser microphone, in contrast, you can back away from a little bit um, without uh, without compromising the sound. In fact, you wouldn't want to put your mouth right up against the grill of a condenser in most cases. Right. Right. I mean, you can see you've got, that's got to be six, I'm eight like, inches. I'm like five inches. Yeah. Five inches yeah. away from the mic. Yeah. This thing's about roughly the same. Yeah. Um, but uh, tell me about Sebastopol, man. I love it up there. You're in an idyllic place. How's it been the last three months up there? Do you feel like you're in the epicenter of Northern California's pandemic? Are you on the outskirts of it and it feels like life is a bit normal or what? You know, it's kind of a, of a mix. Definitely not an epicenter. So, so we're in Sonoma County and I think we've had, I mean, not a ton of cases. I think 300 total cases in the county. Um, so we're not hit in the way that some other areas have been hit. The hospitals never got overrun, never saw any kind of ventilator shortage. I mean, that whole thing kind of passed anyway. Um, so no, I don't feel, you know, for me, it's been kind of business as usual. Mm -hmm. We had definitely had to make some adjustments here at the shop because um, one of my employees, well, both my employees were working from home for uh, two months or something. And that was a real challenge because there are certain kinds of work that can be taken home and there are certain kinds that can't. Mm -hmm. And the early, very, very early week or two of the pandemic, I think as a nation, everyone was just sort of hunkering down, not sure what to do, certainly not spending money on hobbies. Right. <laughs> and then once the news kind of settled, and I think people in general are really good at, at acclimating to mm -hmm. bad news, you know, um, so uh, once the panic passed a little bit and people came to grips with the idea that, okay, I'm going to be stuck at home here for the foreseeable future. And, you know, sadly, a lot of people were out of work. Some other people were adjusting to working, you know, from their couch through a laptop. Um, but our order volume went way up. Mm. Uh, so we sold a bunch of microphones and then my other company uh, sells DIY microphone kits. And so yeah. that business went way up as well because I, I guess a lot of people 
had some interest in microphones, some interest in DIY audio, maybe not a lot of budget, you know, so they had some financial constraints. So they thought, well, maybe I can build a microphone for lower cost than what I would spend on something comparable. And now I have time to do that. And so right. the DIY sales went crazy. Um, but it was hard here because, you know, to fulfill orders, we've got 30 different sizes of boxes and all the bubble wrap and tape and labels and the printer and all, you know, and all the inventory. And so I was doing that myself. Wow. Usually I have a staff to handle fulfillment, but how many, how many folks work for you? Uh, here too, here yeah. in the shop too, and then other people elsewhere. But, but the two that were here weren't here anymore. So that was on right. me. And so, um, so, so life changed, uh, in that way, I was suddenly working huge hours trying to keep up. Mm. Um, but I also was taking packages, uh, out for delivery, you know, to the UPS and FedEx drop points. Um, so, uh, and, and I, you know, I could have scheduled pickups of course, but I'm typically retrieving packages from where stuff gets delivered as well. So, so I was downtown every day, just everyone had a mask on the crew at the UPS store had mask and gloves, but I mean, same couple of people have been you know logging huge hours because you know shipping is through the roof like right it's been nuts it's been christmas times two for like two months yeah yeah so um so those poor folks have been working around the clock just trying to keep up yeah so uh so sebastopol is idyllic for sure um did you get a lot of flight out of the city up to you rentals and whatnot was that happening I, not that i know of i'm not sure i would have known but i kind of feel like it was it was prohibited. I kind of feel like we had health codes that said like, wasn't, wasn't Airbnb and those VRBO weren't, weren't those shut down? They were shut down, but like in our area, we live in Litchfield County in uh, Connecticut about two hours out of the city. And that first week continuing into now, I mean, now there's nothing, there's not a lot left in this, unless you really want to spend literally 65 to $85,000 for the summer from like right now till Labor Day. Wow. If you've got that kind of money, that's what they're renting for. But my mom's in real estate and she was totally off the hook with renters fleeing out of the city. And then, you know, we're a small sort of idyllic little town here too. So like the market got overrun and, you know, it was a whole, it was a whole thing because for them at this point in, well, back in March, is usually our low point, right? Our, our summer folks haven't Season. come up yet, yeah. all that kind of stuff. So they're trying to get rid of inventory, which <laughs> happened in about 48 hours. And within about 48 hours, we were back up to summertime uh, capacity, you know, the middle of March. And so wow. every store here had to adapt, particularly the market very quickly. Um, but I was just thinking, you know, with Sebastopol and Sonoma and whatnot, I wonder if that, that got the same sort of flight out of the cities. Um, I don't think so. My, uh, again, I don't know that I would have known because I'm not in that, I'm not in real estate at all, but, um, I feel like I heard something about how it was prohibited by health codes. Okay. Um, and I think there, sense. there may have been some concern on the part of the people who were, who get to make those decisions Yeah, that, that there would be this exodus of potentially infected people from elsewhere who are looking to escape it, but in fact, bringing it with them. Right. Um, yeah. So I don't know, but, uh, uh, well, I'll tell you, I, I did enjoy, um, there was, there was very little traffic, yeah. you know, parking downtown. I mean, so Sebastopol is a town of 7,000 people. Mm -hmm. Um, there's like main street, you know I mean? It's, it's kind of got this small town vibe to it. Really not much there, but, um, it was nice to be able to park because normally the lots just packed just bumper to bumper. And, um, you know, cause a lot of, a lot of people who live in the city and commute or who telecommute um, do come here because it's wine country, um, you know, former apple country, but, but now grapes have sort of taken over because it's a more lucrative crop, I suppose. And, mm -hmm. um, but you have some of that rustic rural feel, you know, you can get a, a nice house on an acre. Um, and, uh, and if you've got a big, you know, dot com salary, then you can actually afford that. The real estate prices here are just nuts. It's ridiculous yeah. how much stuff costs, but yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, but it's, uh, you know, it's been, uh, it's been peaceful. Uh, you know, we, like we know one or two people who have been dealing with the, the actual illness. 
Yep. But, uh, you know, not a lot of people at all. So. What, um, was there a particular mic on the Roswell side? I'll start with that side. Is there a particular mic or a couple of mics that were clearly the front runner over these last three months? As you said, orders started getting crazy. Was there one or two that were like, everybody wants the, uh, the Delphos or whatever? For sure. Yeah. Well, it, it, it does tend to vary. I mean, you know, Roswell's not a company that's selling a hundred mics a day. Yeah. You know, it's just, we're not, we're not there yet. Um, but the Mini K47 and the Mini K87 are, are very, very popular. You know, the deal with those mics is that they're, in the grand scheme of things, they're inexpensive. Um, we do get some blowback from people who think that microphones ought to cost 50 bucks. And, you know, I sympathize. I just don't know how to make a microphone at that price point that I would want to use. Mm-hmm. So what we try to do is just sort of philosophically is, is put a lot more value into it and still keep it in that, you know, arguably affordable range. So these two, you know, what we call the mini K mics, um, they're both priced under 400 bucks. Um, and they, you know, especially at a time when a lot of people are dealing with financial constraints, um, those provide a way to get great sound on, you know, a budget again, relatively speaking. So, um, the nice thing about those mics is if you, if you, you know, do some research online, you don't have to look very hard, especially in the case of the Mini K47, which has been around longer, right? The Mini K87 is new. We announced it last year at some point, maybe maybe NAM a year ago, maybe AE. I hey, it could have been AES. I think it was yeah. AES. Yeah, it might have been. So that mic is, the 87 has only been out for a year or less. And it does take time to build a market for anything. It takes two mm-hmm. or three years to build a market for anything. But the Mini K47 has been doing that for a while. And uh, if you don't have to look hard to find people um, giving glowing reviews of the microphone. Um, well, I thought one of the best uh, videos on the 87 was that one Chris Salim did. Chris did a very nice video. Because it really takes you through all the phases, you know, just vocals, just talking, guitar, cabs, everything, drums. I mean, he did a great job. Chris did Chris. a great job. Yeah, he's a good guy and he's a really nice job on that. Um, yeah, I mean, there's nothing like uh, a mic reviewer who actually uses it. Yeah, right. <laughs> you wouldn't think that would be such an unusual thing, but um, I've seen a lot of review sites. God, especially if you were to Google like best. I've been shopping for a car stereo upgrade, which is something I've never done. I've, I, like, I haven't thought about car audio in 20 years since I was right. young and had a cool car. And Yeah. Now, you know, you, you get married, you have a kid, and you're like, all right, you know, mid-sized SUV, okay, whatever. Right. <laughs> um, not a minivan, though. Didn't go that far. Yeah, good man. But uh, anyway, I'm, I'm looking for uh, car audio. And if you Google, you know, best speakers, six by nine or you know, best car speakers, best car head unit. You get all of these websites and almost none of them, as far as I can tell, almost, I mean, they they all have these reviews, right? Best head units, best single DIN head units uh, for 2020, right? They're all dated. They're all specific, best high power, you know, best uh, uh, coaxial speakers or whatever, all these terms. I'm not not really a speaker guy, but whatever. Um, And as far as I can tell, none of these people have actually used them. Because they all have stock photos right. from the manufacturer, and they're analyzing uh, specifications. Well, this one has 18 watts. This one has 40 watts, whatever, right? And they're just quoting the cut sheet. I'm like, man, I can, I mean, okay, there's some value added that you've compared them for me, but plug them in, man. Right. <laughs> right. Plug it in and turn it up. <laughs> Tell me how, what they sound like. Tell me what you think. Like, you're supposed to be the expert. Right. You know, you know sound is, is relative, but... Uh, you know, clearly there's no substitute for hearing something yourself. But at the same time, if someone's heard a thousand speakers and then they listen to these three and tell me what they think, like I'm, I'm in for that. I'm, I'm down with that. I want to hear what you think about it. Yep. So anyway, yeah, Chris did an amazing job on that review and, um, and it's been great. So yeah, but the, the mini K's are the best, are the best sellers. They're, uh, it's, it's an interesting thing. They're, um, because they're basically two different colors. And, mm-hmm. you know, microphones are like paintbrushes. Like, I'm not, that quote is not original with me. Uh, I heard it from Larry Valella of uh, ADK. But mm-hmm. uh, the idea is that you can get a sense of some, applying some EQ at the source, right? And, of course, you can do EQ in your DAW later, but it's really not the same thing. 
And it's, it goes back to the comment that you made, Larry, about, you, you know, you want a microphone that you plug it in and it's 85% of the way there. Mm-hmm. You know, of course you can plug in an SM57 and you can twiddle knobs all day long. And of course you're going to get something that you can use. It's a great mic. It's really versatile, but it's not the same thing as plugging in something that just sounds more the way you want it to without having to screw with it for a half an hour and without requiring all kinds of outboard gear to get you there. So the Mini K47 and the Mini K87 are two different flavors. They're not night and day different. You know, I mean, you don't want a microphone that's going to make you sound like AM radio. You know, like, I mean, yeah, you might want that as an effect thing, but you don't need that as a day to day sort of daily driver, podcast, guitar, you know, whatever you got. So these two mics are two different flavors of or colors and um uh and so they're both they're both pretty popular and then we also sell those two as a as a thing called the mixed pair Mm -hmm. um you know matched pairs are great for stereo because if the two mics are really really closely matched then they give you a a good sense of spatial dimension Mm -hmm. so if you were doing like drum overheads is a great example um and you really want to capture that sense of this is what it sounds like from the throne. You know, this is this is what these drums sound like from the drummer's perspective. So matched pairs are really good for that. Um, the mixed pair wasn't, it's not something we did as a stereo solution. You could certainly use it for that. But the idea there was more, um, you know, you're, you're a singer, you sing in different styles. You're a guitar player. All your guitars don't sound the same, mm-hmm. you know? Because why, why would you do that? Why would you have 10 guitars that sound the same? The point of having 10 different guitars is because they feel different, they sound different, they let you do different things creatively. Well, microphones are kind of the same thing. I mean, especially from a guitarist perspective, the microphone is kind of the last thing in your signal chain. You know, guitar players worry about their guitars, their strings, pickups, um, you know, the, the, the maybe the cable, certainly the speaker in an electric guitar situation. They're worried about the the amp. Is it a tube? Is it a solid state? How big is the speaker? You know, which of those two speakers in the cabinet is the one that you want to record, right? So all these things matter. And then the microphone is just like, yeah, whatever, just throw whatever on there. Like, I don't get that at all. I know people who have said that and I don't understand that. It's like, well, do you want to capture the sound that's, you know, that's your sound that's in the room? Yeah. Or are you just going to throw up whatever microphone happens to be not plugged into something else already? And then you just let someone else worry about it. Like I, that, you know, that, that perspective doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So the idea with the mixed pair is that it's two microphones of a different color that let you get that sound that you want. Hmm. And we had a really, uh, a really great experience um, with uh, some ukulele players recently. Um, and they had a mixed pair and they test drove both microphones. And the first email was like, wow, I really love the mini K 47. I want to get another one. And then an hour later, the other email came in and said, oh my God, this 87, mm-hmm. you know, I didn't like it on that ukulele, but on this other one, it is exactly what I needed. And I thought, you know, that's perfect. That is exactly why we came up with this idea. So the mixed pair is one of each? Yeah. Sorry, I didn't say that. Yeah, it's a mini K47 and a mini K87 in a box. Wow. <laughs> wow, that's so, pretty sorry, cool. that was not clear at all. Yeah, so we, we put the two together in like a, a stereo case. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, they come with shock mounts, and it's it, it's actually discounted on the website. Um, really, just for fun, you know, we like the idea that people are experimenting with this, you know, because the the whole Roswell product line is all about sonic colors, and that's true of the microphone parts product line too. That's my my DIY company is um, you can mix and match capsules and circuits to create different colors and textures. So different capsules are going to sound different, and then the you know in a microphone, not to get into the weeds, but uh, the capsule largely determines the frequency response in a general sense. And then the circuit contributes factors like sensitivity and, and, um, and noise, preferably, you know, lack of noise, but also uh, distortion. Um, distortion can be sometimes heard as a bad thing, like distortion bad, right? But no, I mean, there are certain kinds of distortion that are really musical and helpful and a lot of, in a recording situation, this may be less true for live, although I, I don't know a lot about live sound, but certainly in a recording studio, there's a reverence for vintage gear. Mm-hmm. And that could be microphones, it could be preamps, consoles, EQs, compressors, old tube gear. It's not, it doesn't have to be tube gear, but usually is, is really put up on a pedestal. It has a magical sound that people really appreciate. And part of that magical sound is the addition of of 
harmonics. So it's harmonic coloration. So you're putting in your your sound, your source, whatever it is, voice or guitar, or whatever it is, and then the gear is adding its own harmonics to it. So it's the gear is creating a sound that wasn't there in the first place, but it sounds good. And that's why people love that gear. And that's that's a contribution that a certain microphone circuit could have. It doesn't have to, but it could be designed to do that. So so that's the idea with with all those all the products that I make is that you know, you pick what you want. If you want, you know, and, and words are squishy, right? Sound is sound is hard to describe. Yeah. Um, but if you want, uh, you know, something more modern, more clean, those are words typically associated with certain kinds of gear. Mm-hmm. Then you might go this way. And if you want something that's more vintage, more vibey, tube sound, uh, more colored, then you might steer this way, right? So, so. The idea of the Roswell product line is we're going to try to fill as many of those boxes as we can. And so the idea of the mixed pair is we want to reward people for going on that journey with us, right? We want people to experiment with these different sonic colors by buying microphones that sound a little bit different. So it's like it's dipping your toe in the water, right? It's a, it's a, let me try this microphone on this source. And okay, let's, now we know what that sounds like. Let me switch the mic out and say, okay, well, I see what it's doing now. So there's this opportunity for people to experiment with the different colors and see what they like. And that hopefully informs, you know, their next purchase decision as well to say, now I've got, you know, these sort of bases covered. What else, like, what else do you have? What else can I add to this to complement this collection? You mentioned live audio a little bit ago. I know live audio is not your thing necessarily, but I know that you have tried these out in live settings. Um, Yeah. So, so for the live audio folks listening, what's been some of the feedback on these and, you know, where do you, where do you hope they'll sit out there? What would, in terms of what someone could use these on? Yeah. So the, the big, the, the big issue regarding microphones and, and live sound, as I understand it is most live audio is, is uh, uses dynamic microphones so moving coil dynamics sometimes ribbons as well but uh you know if you take like a an sm57 sm58 super common stage mics those are a, a type of microphone called a moving coil dynamic they tend to hear what's right in front of them they tend to f- reject feedback really well uh, but it's the former point. It's it's the uh, it's the hearing the stuff that's right in front of them, and, and and also by extension, not hearing stuff that's six feet away. That's the big. Uh, that's one of the main selling points for those things in that stage environment. The other th- aspect is that they're indestructible, right? You can pound right. nails with those mics, and they'll still work. You can drive a car over them. You can soak them in a beer, and they won't smell good, but they'll still work. Yep. So, um, so those are all really important characteristics. You know, ruggedness and basically limited field of, of hearing, those are really valuable for a stage kind of situation. However, the world has changed a little bit. So a lot of folks are not using floor wedge monitors anymore. They're using in-ears, which means, and you know, a lot of guys, a lot of people are going direct because especially in a smaller venue, you know, if you've got 100 dB coming out of the Marshall stack and, and the drummer, then everything else has to be turned up loud to compensate. And you just have this huge wall of noise coming off stage. Um, putting a condenser mic in front of that band is a disaster, right? Right. That, you know, the, the singer, it's going to hear the singer, but it's going to hear everything behind him as well. And it's going to be a nightmare. You're going to have feedback for days. So a condenser mic on a loud stage is going to be challenging unless it's like on a guitar cab. Right. If it's right up against the grill, it's not going to hear anything else. Um, but even like as a drum overhead, that would I think that would be a little sketchy, like condensers on a, on a loud stage on drum overheads. I, like, again, I'm, I don't have that experience, but I would be wary of that. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there are folks out here out there that can make that work. Maybe if they've got, you know, the plex of walls around the drummer, plexiglass walls, maybe that helps. I really don't know. Yeah. Um, but those are those are kind of the issues that outline this. And I and where we've seen success is on quieter stages um, where there's you know primarily acoustic instruments um, and lower volumes on stage and uh, and no floor monitors that's a big win as well um, 
So that's one scenario in where these condensers can really work. And, and the reason you'd want to use use them is because they, they just sound better, right? A condenser mic is going to capture more detail mm -hmm. and more body. Mm -hmm. um, so what the feedback that we hear from live sound guys is number one, you know, oh my God, they have so much output. So yeah, compared to a 57, 58, all the mics I make have, you know, six, eight, 10, 12 decibels higher output. So if you're used to turning up your preamp to give the, the mic a bunch of level, you won't need to do that. You'll need a lot less level at the preamp with the condenser microphone. So that's one issue. The other issue or the other feedback we get is that they sound great. Um, it's, you know, if you're used to putting a 57, 58 on an acoustic guitar and you swap it out for, a, you know, one of my condensers, you're going to get a lot more low end, a lot more detail on top. It won't be harsh at all. Um, you just get a much richer, fuller sound. So those are the kinds of feedback that we get. Um, I uh, And the mics are, are pretty durable. You know, they come with a, a case that's lined with foam. So yeah, you're not going to throw the bare mic into the bottom of the road case. But if you put it back in, in the case that it came with, it's going to have no problem surviving to the next uh, to the next show. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so that's, uh, that's what I know about live sound. Uh, that's probably more than I actually know about live sound, but <laughs> hopefully that's some helpful guidance for folks. <laughs> you, uh, if I recall correctly, you started out as a drummer. Yeah. And, yeah. and had a pretty, pretty awesome run doing that. Um, and then you started heading toward microphones. I'm curious with you for you, why microphones? You know, you, you could have been drawn as an as a lover of music and whatnot. You could have gone down any path. I'm, you know, I was curious about this with Tony uh, Fishman over at Telefunken or even an amp guy or anyone like that. You know, why microphones for you? So the uh, my experience was that I was doing home recording when it was just becoming feasible. So in those days, it was. Um, relatively easy to get a like a stereo input like you get something that was called a sound card that term isn't used nearly as much as it used to be it used to literally be a thing you'd plug into your computer inside your computer um and then uh, it had you know two like rca jacks or quarter inch or something on the back i don't remember exactly but you could get sound into your computer and then it had some kind of rudimentary analog digital converter on the card that's what the card did and um and so uh so I was trying to record drums and I guess, you know, it was a few years on past, you know, those, those are like four track days, right? Four track cassette deck days. Um, and a few years beyond that, uh, you know, DigiDesign had come out with uh, the Digi002. Yep. That's kind of when I started recording at home in earnest. And the 002 was this, um, I had the, they had a, like a, a freestanding version and then they had a rack mount unit. I had the rack mount unit. So it had four mic pre's in it and then it had inputs. It had four line ins. And then it had an ADAT in, I guess, where you could do another eight. And then it had some other kind of input, optical or something that would do, I guess the ADAT was the optical. Anyway, I forget the details, but the, this was the first time for me that I was, I realized I'd be able to record a drum set because in my mind, recording a drum set would require like 20 microphones, you know, why right. not? So I had just set up all this stuff. I had probably just kick snare and overheads, probably had just four, because I only had four pre's in the early days. So uh, I had four inputs, so I had four microphones and I'd, I recorded my drums and, I, and I, I bought a pair of microphones based on a recommendation that I found online. In those days, information was a little hard to come by, at least that was my perspective on it. And I'd found a forum, I think it was the Tape Op forum back in the day. And someone had recommended, uh, a certain kind of microphone and I bought a pair of them and I knew very little about microphones in those days, but I put them up and I recorded and I was, you know, in retrospect, I wasn't really knocked out about the sound. I was like, well, I guess that's what it sounds like. You know, you put microphones up and this is what you get. I'd really didn't, I had no basis for comparison and that informed some of my later efforts to the idea of comparing microphones, mm. because if you just have one thing to listen to, it's really hard to understand what you've got. Yeah. Unless you've got years and years of experience, in which case you're comparing to memories, right? But if you have no memories and no experience, then you record something and then you're like, well, I don't know. Does that sound good? Does it sound the way I, does it sound the way I want it to sound? And at that time, I didn't have any experience or ears and so that was that. And I did some recording and, you know, one thing leads to another and 
I was researching online to, to find uh, other people talking about these microphones that I had because I wanted that kind of social proof. Like I wanted people to tell me that I'd made the right choice. And, um, and I couldn't, for the life of me, couldn't find the forum thread where these microphones had been recommended. Um, what I found instead was a, a discussion about these microphones that was kind of like a hate fest. Mm. Is like this microphone that I ended up with somehow was really kind of not well respected by a lot of people. Um, and somehow I, I mysteriously not discovered any of this conversation when I was buying them. And the, the quote that sticks in my mind about this on my, my second foray into the world to try to find people talking about these mics was a guy who posted something along the lines of, I keep a pair of those around the studio so I can loan them out to people I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I bought a different, an alternate pair of overhead microphones and I plugged them in and recorded with the first set, recorded with the second set. And, you know, my drums hadn't changed. The room hadn't changed. The preamps hadn't changed. Heads hadn't changed. Tuning hadn't changed. I certainly hadn't gotten any better as a drummer. And yet my drums sounded night and day better mm. with the second pair. And that literally changed my life because in that moment I realized, so this little thing, this little tube with a cable coming out one end massively influences the sound of the recording in a way I had never fathomed before. And all I have to do as an engineer to get better sounds, and this is naive of course, but in the moment I thought all I have to do is get better microphones. And then I would go on later and, and test preamps and those make a difference, but it's a smaller difference. And uh, converters, same deal. They make it, it makes a difference to me. You know, this is my perspective. They make the converter makes a difference, but it's a smaller difference than the transducer. And I guess the same, I think the same thing would be true of a home stereo, right? If, if you change the amp, you'll, you might hear it, but it's going to be a relatively small change as compared to if you change your speakers. And I, the way that makes sense to me is that the transducer, whether sound is coming into it, or going out of it. It's that moment where energy is transferred from electricity to vibrating airwaves or vice versa. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the moment where there's the biggest opportunity to influence the sound of the thing. Right. So that's what, that was the sort of watershed moment for me. And that's how I got into microphones and, and it just went, I kind of went overboard from there. I, I started buying them and testing them and writing about them and taking them apart and analyzing them. And then, upgrading them and modifying them and um you know got really deep into capacitors and resistors and you know, the components that are inside you know transformers and tubes of course capsules of course um you know the size of the of the microphone body the diameter all this kind of stuff really matters and so um and you know so that just picture that sort of snowball rolling down a hill and at the bottom of that hill there's roswell pro audio and microphone parts and so i'm kind of full-time designing, developing, building, and selling microphones. And what was the mission when you started Roswell? And has it changed to this point? Because, and, and the other question is, uh, you know, you're starting a microphone company. That's like starting a guitar amplifier company. So you're going up against, obviously, it's, the big ones. It's a terrible everybody idea. Knows, right? <laughs> it's a horrible idea, man. <laughs> um, what are you thinking, man? And so how do you find... How do you find your lane, you know, for, for the future inventor of something out there who's listening, you know, how do you look at that and say, fuck, there's the, you know, all the companies, again, there's so many to name. I can find my little niche. I can find my lane here and, and go for it. Yeah, it's, uh, I backed into it and I avoided it for years. So I started doing the DIY thing and there wasn't really anybody else doing do-it-yourself microphone kits. There was one guy who sold some capsules and some transformers and, and actually that was maybe, that was about it. I was, I feel like I was one of the early people into that market. And I was also early in terms of providing the complete kit. So here's the microphone, it's disassembled. There was one other company that was doing that, but it was basically a, it was a microphone that if it had been built, it would only cost you like a hundred bucks anyway. Mm. So it's like, yeah, you can build it and that's cool, but the document, there wasn't really documentation and when it's finished, it doesn't sound very good, that's my opinion. But uh, so I took it to what I think was like, you know, 
where, where I, I, well, I build the products that I would want to use. So my DIY stuff was really great parts, top to bottom, kind of no compromise. Fantastic documentation. You know, the kits come with this like 30 or 40 page book, full color, step by step, little arrows pointing at things to make sure you get the details. And every time someone emails me and says, hey, I, I didn't understand this or I did this wrong, I, I go back into the manual and revise it. So I say, look, don't do this. Like some people might interpret this to mean that. Like, how can I reword this so that it's more clear? Mm. So the manuals have come a long way, gotten a lot better over, over time. And the thing about that, though, is that people would ask me to build it, and there's no way to build those kits really economically. Um, but I could take those ideas and some of those sounds, and that's what Roswell started as, was how do I take the best ideas from my DIY company but make them, I don't want to say mass market because there's nothing mass market about boutique microphones, but you know, the DIY stuff, like we can make two of something, and that's okay. Roswell can't make two of something, right? At the Roswell scale, like if you are going to go out there and compete with companies like Shure and Neumann, Sennheiser, um, you kind of need to do hundreds at a time. Right. Because you have to design a package. You have to have logos. You know, there's all this other stuff that has nothing to do with how the thing sounds. Now, certainly how the thing sounds is our most, that's the most critical thing for me. Like, I care a lot more about how it sounds than how it looks. And I get some grief for that. You know, people are like, well, why didn't you design a fancier body? I'm like, well, because you can't hear the shape and the color of the body on the record. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, yeah, we can do fancier metal work. It's just, it adds to the cost. Like, and that limits my audience. And I can't, at this point, I can't really afford that. Like I need, I need, because I am competing with companies whose, you know, like my entire annual revenues are a rounding error for them. Right. <laughs> So I need to come out with something that's affordable and sounds great. And it's, that's hard to do. So, no. uh, so yeah, we, we sometimes compromise on things like the shape of the body and like, you know, that is what it is. So, yeah. um, anyway, Roswell came out of this idea of how do I take the stuff that the DIY market has proved is really popular. Like this is a sound that people want, but they don't want to build it. So how can I come out with a product that, that sort of, provides that sound you know with a fuller package like a you don't have to build it b it comes with accessories and a logo and a warranty and all that stuff that makes you feel good about the purchase um without compromising on the sound so that's what roswell came from and uh it's been um you know if i had it to do over I'd, i might do things slightly differently um th there are some nuances to the business that i've sort of stumbled over and learned the hard way <laughs> So, uh, but it's, it's been fun and it's been really good. And I, I really appreciate the, uh, uh, you know, like the path and the journey and where we've come. I mean, I got a, an email today from Bill Payne, who's the, um, keyboard player for Little Feet. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, Bill is amazing. He's an incredible musician and, uh, and now he's singing for the band too. He's getting into home recording and he's got a pair of mini K47s that he loves and that that kind of stuff blows me away because I'm a Little Feet fan. I mean, I've, yeah. I've I played the hell out of their records when I was in college. It was like I, you know, I'm not sure those CDs left the CD player for days. Yeah. Time. So yeah, to to be able to work with people that I consider musical idols is so fulfilling to me. So, um, but that's you know, you know, for for guys like him, he's not going to build a microphone. You know. Yeah. So Roswell enables me to reach a bigger group of people who just want the thing to be simple. You plug it in and it sounds good and you don't have to worry about it. So yep. you have a sentence on the website about uh, the company and that you're solar powered, recycle, yeah. reduce, reuse. Is that a, was that a, a big part of it for you as well to be uh, environmentally conscious and whatnot, eco-conscious about the products and about your business practices or that come later? You know, I've just always kind of been that way. Um, I've recycled forever. It just feels right to me. Mm -hmm. Wait, like I hate waste. Yeah. You know, I don't know what something, maybe something in my childhood, I couldn't even tell you, but uh, we, we are solar powered. Um, we've had PV photovoltaic on the roof for, I guess we had it at our old house for about, uh, 
eight years before we moved and we've been in this place for seven years. So I guess about 15 years we've been solar powered. So that feels good. Uh, we recycle everything we possibly can. We compost all that kind of stuff. Yeah. It just makes sense to me. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So it's okay. All right. I like it. I, I dig it, man. I think it's good. Um, what do you think that um, this whole pandemic situation, this is a question I've enjoyed asking people. Um, what is it exposed for Roswell for you in terms of the strengths and weaknesses of the company? You know, as you look at how you've had to pivot, send people yeah. home, work from home, that kind of stuff. As you come back, as we do get back to normal, because we will get back to normal people. Um, are there going to be some things you change or yeah, things you absolutely. don't change? You know, um, it has, definitely exposed some weaknesses. So we had three guys crammed in a relatively small shop and that was fine until March or whatever, you know, whenever this whole thing kind of hit the fan. Um, so I've got a contractor friend of mine coming by, um, hopefully today or tomorrow. Um, we're talking about breaking ground on a thousand square foot shop that among other things, I mean, it will allow us to expand capabilities for sure. But, um, it will also give us like segmented workspaces. Mm -hmm. So I, I love the idea that we're going to get back to normal, but I don't know that I see it. Like at what point, like, so is there a vaccine? Uh, does that make it okay? Will everyone get vaccinated? I mean, we're like, I don't feel exposed. I don't feel like I'm at risk necessarily. Mm -hmm. In March, it was different, you know, in March, or whenever, maybe it was April uh, at some point. So, I, you know, I, I mentioned before that I'd been like running the whole shop by myself and I was going crazy because it, because business was way up. Yeah. Um, but I, and, and my staff was gone. Like I, I was so screwed. So I finally convinced one of my guys to come back. I said, look, man, I will disinfect this place nightly and you'll have, I'll close the door. Like um, you'll have two thirds of the building to yourself. Um, and we won't, we won't, like, I literally didn't see him for a month. Like he came in and worked and he was working like swing shift. Like maybe that's not the right word. He was working 5.00 AM to 1.00 PM. Wow. Um, and I literally didn't see him for weeks. Uh, but, uh, anyway, the, the, uh, and then, the, you know, it, it's, it's saved us really because he was able to, to do work here that he couldn't do elsewhere. And then it meant I didn't have to do it. But, um, anyway, to make a long story interminable, uh, <laughs> it, it, this experience drove home the point that um, we need more space. Uh, we need more people. We need more space. We need more space for people to work. Um, I don't know that, uh, like, we don't disinfect anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, I guess that's the point I was trying to make. We don't wipe the place down. Um, I, I was, like, fumigating with Lysol and all this stuff. We haven't done that in weeks, and, mm -hmm. and everyone's still healthy. So I think that part's all fine, but, but there's still a line. Like, I wear a mask. I don't go in there when, when that employee is there. My, when my other employee comes in in the afternoons, he's new. I had to train him. Uh, so we're used to being face-to-face -face with masks because the training is was hands-on. I mean, we were both three feet apart. And, yeah. Um, so for that, you know, we're, I'm in and out of there and we just wear masks and try to keep our distance. But I don't know that that's sustainable. And I don't know that anyone is going to be willing to work 10 feet from someone and wear a mask all day. I mean, the masks, I, I mean, I, I believe the science. I get the thing about droplets. That all makes sense to me, but I hate wearing a mask. Yeah. You know, it, I do it, but it's uncomfortable and I would not want to be in a job where I had to do that all day long. So yeah, I think the takeaway for me is I don't know that there's going to be a return to the old days. I think there's going to be, you know, air quotes, new, a new normal. And, um, and we're just going to have to be separate. Mm more so um yeah so it's a challenge but i think that's where we're at how about the strengths that it exposed for you in the company well we're nimble um we we've taken on too much which is why we're understaffed so we're scrambling a lot but it means we can scramble to go where the demand is you know um so that part's good. Um, we've adjusted on the fly um, and and we've succeeded in delivering on our biggest two months ever with reduced <laughs> staff. That's amazing. So, yeah. So that was, I'm proud of that. On the other hand, I wish we didn't, I mean, it's dumb that 
like it's a massive management failure on my part that we had to do that. <laughs> right. So I'm, I'm cognizant of the failure that that, you know, illustrates as well, but, um, but pleased that we pulled it off. So most of the parts are made in the U S yeah. We source stuff from all over. From all over. Okay. Um, like, you know, in large part, the metal work comes from overseas because, you know, like microphone grills, I'm not sure anyone in America makes microphone grills. Mm. I've tried. I called 50 machine jobs. Couldn't find a single person who had the hydraulic press. Uh, well, yeah, some shops had the press, but the tool and die is 5,000 bucks or wow. something to make a part that sells for 30. I mean, right. you have to sell just to pay the, for the tool and then your tool wears out. It's just like, it's crazy. Yeah. So a lot of that stuff comes from overseas. We do as much as we can here. Um, you know, a lot of parts too, like the components, you know, the resistors are made in Malaysia, I think. Like I, right. I, I mean, we have one supplier, this U.S. company, but I think they actually make them in Malaysia as well. Like, so yeah, I can buy from a U.S. supplier who's buying them from somewhere else. So, yeah, you know, it's, I, we live in a, a global economy and the reality is that some stuff is just it's impractical to make it in certain places. Sure. And it's, um, it can be hard to get, uh, to get quality. And it's, you know, for me, what I've found the hard way is that it, uh, it matters a lot less, uh, where it's made than how it's made. Mm -hmm. So if, if your supplier can honor specs and tolerances and keep the tools sharp and, inspect things i mean i've you know i've had stuff painted like i've had the worst nightmares with painting in the u.s hmm. just like i pay five times as much and the quality is a third of what if i just get it painted overseas wow it's crazy the, the delta and i you know as a consumer i mean you know and i love i love to make stuff that's made in the u.s I don't think I have anything that's entirely made in the U.S. because I don't. I, if people couldn't afford it; they wouldn't pay for it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so no disrespect at all to people who have figured out ways to do this or who just require that in their products. I mean, more power to you. Um, from my perspective, I don't know that I could stay in business because everything I make would be three or four times higher price. And I guess the the, the real point of my question too was during these last three, four months, three and a half months, did you have any, because stuff was coming from overseas, did you have any sort of supply chain issues? We've had a few, uh, but not just, I mean, you know, one of the Roswell mics uses a Rycote shock mount. Rycote's in the UK. They didn't ship anything, as far as I can tell, for six weeks. Mm. So I had massive back orders on Rycote shock mounts. That's got to be so, so frustrating to have everything else. Yeah. And it's ready to go out the door, but you're missing like the mount. <laughs> yeah, which is crazy. So, yeah. yeah, so we've had a few, you know, for the most part, no. Um, honestly, the harder thing now is um, one of my DIY products is a, 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 a tube microphone, vacuum tube microphone. And we sold out of the body. So the body in the suitcase that it comes in come from overseas. You know, we make the circuit boards and here and all that stuff. But um you know, the, the place that makes those is like, you know, all those factories were closed January, February, half of March, you know, and they started ramping back up probably in March or April. Um, but now they're overrun with orders. I'm sure. So what, what, what normally might've been 60, 90 days is now looking at, you know, 120 or something like that. So, so yeah, the, this pandemic has kind of rolled through, the suppliers and the customers and unfortunately people placing orders now on the tail end of that are screwed. Yeah. So yeah, yeah there's going to be a big gap in delivery for some stuff and we haven't really been hit yet, but we're going to be, you know, in the next two months, we're going to be short on some things that we just can't get back. Oh man. Crazy time indeed, Matt. Well, listen, man, I so appreciate you taking time to, uh, step away from filling orders to come and chat with me it means a lot. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad you guys have been knocking out of the park in the last couple of months with your busiest time and, and highest number of orders. I think that's amazing. 
And uh, if I can ever get up to Northern California, I'd love to come see in Sebastopol and check out the new facility uh, <laughs> if that ever gets built, man. Yeah, I hope it does. We'll see. Yeah. All right, there you go. There you have it, guys. Matt, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. Stay safe out there, my brother. Folks, we'll see you next week, episode 173 with Chris Bedry. Systems tech for the Tedeschi Trucks Band will be my guest. During the week, you can follow us at Facebook, Instagram, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, YouTube, and Spotify, all as Rody Free Radio. Check out the website, RodyFreeRadio.com. Send me a note because you know I want to hear from you. That's info at RodyFreeRadio.com. And my friends, in the meantime, y'all be safe out there. No roadies. No rock and roll.